Autism. My name is Zara, I'm from Open, uh, Open Knowledge Foundation and I work with School of Data. So together with the European Journalism Center, we organize the School of Data Journalism. Um, I think this is the third year that we've done this at the International Journalism Festival. Um, so the School of Data Journalism is for journalists to get an idea of some data skills that might help them. Um, so this morning we had, uh, so just this afternoon we had an introduction to basic chart types and now we've got an introduction to telling stories with maps from our School of Data fellow, Codrina. Um, we have some other workshops coming up over the next few days. The hashtag is DDJ School, so please uh, use that if you're tweeting and we'll gather all the tweets up at the end. And yeah, I'll, I'll give the microphone to Kadrina to, to go us, tell us through this, uh, the workshop. Okay. Uh, I don't know if this works. No? Okay. Hi, everyone. I feel a little bit uneasy speaking at a microphone, so. <laughs> Okay, uh, welcome to the Telling Stories with Maps workshop, presentation, more presentation than a workshop. <laughs> uh, so, um, let's start. Uh, but before starting, I'd like to say that um, I'm used to more hands-on workshops, which means that I really hope that during my presentation, during the time that I'll talk, you will actually want to talk to me back. So if you ever have any kind of questions related to what I'm talking about, I would really like it if you could just raise your hand and say, I did not understand that, could you please repeat? Or uh, what does it mean? Or can you elaborate on this thing? And so on, okay? So just a little bit about myself and how I got here, because as you have probably noticed, I'm not really a journalist. <laughs> So, I am um, Kodrina Elie, I come from Romania, here I represent School of Data Open Knowledge. I'm no longer a fellow, my fellowship ended. <laughs> so, um, in Romania I'm part of this community that is called geospatial.org and it's a community of voluntary uh, geospatial people uh, working to build this vir virtual environment of sharing knowledge and data related to anything that goes with GEO. Um, I work in a research project that is called geoidea.ro and this is a project through which we're trying to um, open data, geodata in Romania. It's a collaboration with uh, the ATH Zurich um, in uh, Switzerland and uh, during my daytime I'm trying to do a PhD in groundwater uh, geodata structuring. So. This is who I am. <laughs> and um, here is a short summary of our time together, <laughs> what we are going to be uh, speaking of. I am going to start uh, with talking about data, okay? Because uh, when you do a map, you need data. And um, in that chapter, I will be speaking about open data, which I think should be of your interest, or at least when building a map. And I'll explain why. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about Creative Commons, which is a certain type of licenses uh, for data, of course. And then I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about where can we actually get this information that we need to make a basic map, to make a more complex map, and so on. And in the end, I'm going to make a very small comparison, because I think it is important. Uh, between OpenStreetMap and a proprietary company, which is Google Maps. I've chosen this one because it's the biggest and most people know of it. Uh, the chapter two, it's called Maps, <laughs> and I'm going to talk about visualizing geodata and if um, to visualize the data that we have, is it really necessary to build a map? I'm going to talk about uh, basic visualization um, theoretical aspects, if you'd like, like color and composition in a map. It's nothing very, uh, very geeky. I, um, I'm trying to reach the basics to, uh, to explain better what we're looking at when we see a map. And afterwards, I'm going to talk about ways to 
perceive or to induce through the way that you build your map. And afterwards, a little bit of types of maps. And then, uh, if you are still with me, <laughs> we are going to do, I'm going to do a little bit of demo and show you um, software, which is quite common and probably most of you have heard of, um, how to actually ad literum build a map. Good. Um, so what is data? You work with data every day. I work with data every day. Uh, but how do you define it? Well, data seems to be a set of values of qualitative or quantitative variables. Data is measured, collected, and reported, analyzed, whereupon it can be visualized using graphics, images, or um, maps. So uh, this is how your data usually looks like. It comes in tabular data, in, in tabular uh, form. So can anyone tell me the difference between data and information? Has anyone ever thought of uh, if there is a difference between these two? We usually hear, uh, I have data, I have information, I need data, I need information. Well, I can tell you that there is a difference, and it's a really big one, because data are just numbers. For example, one, two, three, four, five. It is data. Information means actually putting a meaning to that sign that you write. And through this slide, I tried to show this, because in the first image that you have on top, it's just a, uh, it's just a table. It doesn't really tell you that much. You don't really know what that is. But you can see in the image below that you have that table head showing you what actually those letters, um, numbers mean. So this is the difference between data and information. And I think it's important to notice it. The way that we collect data, these are a few images that I, <laughs> that I thought would be representative. You go on field to take data, you make short sketches, you make interviews, you digitize data. For example, you take uh, a map and you draw lines on top of it and you build another kind of data, another kind of format, and of course the very friendly browser looking for data online. Um, I think in this in this time that we are going through, uh, open data has become an important syntax that most of us have heard of, I think. Um, I'd like just one quick question. Uh, which one of you, by this time, has used at least one set of open data? It doesn't matter how, yeah, in an article, just look through it, just. Okay, so we have, okay, three people, four people, five, six. Okay, that's not that bad. <laughs> so um, open data is data that can be freely used, reused, and redistributed by anyone subject only at most to the requirement to attribute and share alike. This is the um, official, the official definition of open data. But what practically means is that Open data is something that you can take, use, you do not pay for it. This is the uh, uh, like, if you'd like, definition. Is it important? Yes. Does any data can be open data? No. There are very, very strict rules that define what data can become available as open and what not. There are three types of data that will never, or at least should never be available. And one of that is personal information. For example, your uh, a code of passport from the passport, your image and your name, that is personal data. And that, legally speaking, should never be available. Uh, information related to national security. That is something that cannot be given as open data. There are a few... Uh, very important um, things that data must respect, aspects that data must respect in order to be uh, open data. 
and open knowledge some years ago, I think, about five or six, has um, listed them. Uh, I have written them here on the slide, and we're talking about availability and access. The data must be available as a whole, in bulk, and at no more than a reasonable reproduction cost, a marginal cost. Uh, reuse and redistribution. The data must be provided under terms that permit reuse and redistribution, uh, including the intermix with other data sets. This is something that unfortunately does not always apply and I will explain later why and in what conditions. Uh, reuse and redistribution refers here to licensing and we are going to talk about Creative Commons uh, in just a few moments. And of course, universal participation. Open data should be available for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a private person or if you are a company or you come from a university or so on. Okay. So why do we need data and is it, is it something that can really help us grow? This is a, this is a image that I find really, really revealing. So what is actually data? What is information? What do you do with the both, the way that you present it? You know, you make a cake and then knowledge means eating that cake, understanding what you have seen, understanding the data, understanding the information. And of course, uh, um, an, an, an added value, the wisdom, you know, you, you go and burn added calories. Good. Uh, moving on, we are going to be talking a little bit about Creative Commons. Uh, another question for you, how many of you have heard of this Creative Commons? Okay, that is very good. Uh, may I ask at least one person in what kind of context they heard about Creative Commons? I think I have to run with the mic. Can anyone tell me in what context they've heard, tell me, tell the audience, in what context they heard about Creative Commons? Cheers for your article that are under this license. Okay, so practically, what is Creative Commons? What does this tell you? What Creative Commons is, simply put, a license. A license is that document that you attach to the data that you create in order to tell other people what it is, what it, is it for yeah. and what, what exactly they can do with it, what they are allowed to do with it. Why is it important? Because Creative Commons is international. It is a standard that's international. That means that if I use it in Romania, somebody in the United States will understand legally what I have allowed them to do and what I have not allowed them to do with my data. Okay? There are a few types of licenses and um, the most important terms that we should remember and we should look for in licensing is attribution, um, no derivative works, share alike, and non-commercial. Um, there is a problem with licensing, and I think it is important to mention. You will hear during my talk, and uh, probably you have already heard about open government data. There are lots of governments out there that under the Open Government Partnership or under the Public Sector Information European Directive have started to open public data sets. So data sets that ministry, ministries gather or collect or produce, they put out there for the public to use. In order to do that, they have to license it. And there are lots of governments out there that have built their own licenses. Uh, UK has its license, Romania has its license, Spain has its license, uh, Sweden has its license, Denmark has its license. There are lots of licenses and the problem is that these are not perfectly legally interoperable. This is why when you build your own data set, you as a person, as a journalist, as a media company, as a company, as a government, it is really important to use a license that is international and that has 
a very well established standard. Okay, uh, now that we are going to talk about maps, mapping and so on, I think it is important to make a difference between what data is and what geodata is. The difference is not that big, sometimes incessible, uh, but it is very important. So geodata is probably mm, practically data with location. If you can locate it, it doesn't matter in what form it comes. For example, a sketch on your notebook, in a table, in a picture, a geocoded picture. It doesn't matter if you can locate it. Absolutely means on the face of the Earth or on another planet. But if you can locate it, then it can become geodata. I have written there relative as well. This means that you can actually create a space. For example, my position here is one relative position towards the first row in front. If I move and if we do not take into consideration the absolute location of someone or of something, if I move, then they, their position relative to me will change as well. You can build maps using relative position. Um, Okay, how do we find data? Uh, data comes through portals, through geoportals, and the way to get to those is, of course, through our friend, the Google browser, or what in any kind of browser. So, what are the first places you should look for information? First of all, uh, I'd like to mention that the, uh, the geoportals and the portals I'm going to be talking about um, are important when you want to build a map, a visualization, but of course you need it as a background or as data towards uh, with which you want to compare what, or what you already have. So if you want information or data that comes in a readable format as open data, something that a GIS software can manipulate, can uh, visualize, uh, you go and you look at these guys. For example, big international organizations such as World Bank, such as the European uh, Agency for Environment, such as the United Nations. If you look through their website, you will most certainly find um, uh, tabs that are called data or data and maps and so on. Those are usually the first places one must look. And why? Because that is official information. Um, I have mentioned before GIS software. GIS comes from Geospatial informa uh, Geographical Information System. Sorry. Okay, so here I gave two examples of of these kind of tabs that come with, that are included in big international organization websites and geoportals. Dedicated geoportals. What means dedicated geoportals? Means people, organizations, company that work with this kind of data, with geographical data, geographical information. For example, uh, Eurogeographics. This Eurogeographics is a union of all the mapping agencies in Europe. And what is important is that at the beginning of 2013, they have made freely available the Euroglobal map, which is data compiled from national mapping agencies supplied by 45 European countries and territories. And again, I'd like to stress the fact that this is official data. Being official doesn't necessarily mean that it is 100% accurate. Being official means that an official organization is vouching for it. Of course, I know that nobody is naive enough to believe that a data set will always be 100% correct. Um, another dedicated geoportal that is very useful for basic maps, if you're not thinking about Google Maps or if you not thinking about Yahoo being or OpenStreetMap is the Natural Earth. This is a community of 
volunteers that have been building for the last 12 years, I think, uh, free vector and raster maps data for the entire world. Uh, you can see here two words that might not look very familiar to you, which is vector and raster. These are two of the most uh, used formats for geographic data. And when I say geographic data, I wouldn't want you to think that only precipitation data is geographic or only relief data, but any, any kind of data set that has an absolute location is geographical data. Uh, vector is a format, um, and raster is <laughs> the second one. Um, I'm not going to enter into technical details at this point. We are going to talk about this when I'm going to present the desktop GIS I have planned for you. And of course, the uh, third resource that you should be looking at when searching for data and geodata is of course the data.gov portals. As mentioned at the beginning, we have the uh, open government partnership, we have the um, PCI directive, public sector information, uh, legislative acts, agreements that um, more or less force uh, governments to publish their data sets online, publicly available and freely available. And uh, you can discover these sites by just typing um, data.gov and at the end you just use the termination for each country like Rho or UK or so on. This is uh, uh, a capture from uh, the Open Data Census, which is a project led by Open Knowledge. And what they're trying to do is exactly like they're saying in the title, tracking the state of open data around the world. And I think I made this, uh, this capture of my uh, desktop probably three weeks ago. So then we had about 281 open data catalogs around the world. So that's a lot of information, a lot of information. And most, uh, most of it is accurate, is official, and worth your time to investigate. And another, another Another appropriate, let's say, data, data repository, if you'd like, is the data repositories that come from science. This open, open movement, open source, open data, um, has extended into the research environment, into the scientific community. And you should find things related to open, to this movement, under the names of open access, open science, and so on. And there is a very important movement right now in the scientific community where people are trying to convince each other, if you'd like, to share their data, their research data, and by adding it to common research repositories. Um, there are a few out there that are very important, like DataBib. And if you are wondering why, this is important because it's research. You know, maybe that data is going to become unuseful in, not useful in the last, in the next five years. Is that uh, last year in Nature, uh, article appeared saying that scientists uh, losing data are losing data at a very rapid rate. So this problem exists, and they are starting to acknowledge it. And this is a consequence. So these are the, um, the geo portals that are available out there and data sets. You have the research data, you have the government open data portals, you have the uh, big organizations across the world portals, and you have dedicated geo portals like Natural Earth or Eurogeographics. Um, I think, it, uh, I think it is important at this, at this stage to talk a little bit about OpenStreetMap and Google Maps because we have spoken about licenses, we have spoken a little bit about what data is and what geodata is. 
So now I think it's important to bring matters closer to home, so to speak. Um, please raise your hand how many of you have used Google Maps. Okay, how many of you have used OpenStreetMap? Okay, that's promising. So um, there is a very clear difference. There are more than, there's more than just one clear difference between OpenStreetMap and Google Maps. I'd like to mention again that I've just, I've just chosen Google Maps because it's one of the most renowned in the world and I was sure that everybody heard of it and at least used it once. Um, so I've made a very small list with what are the differences that I think you should consider when you speak of OpenStreetMap or you're considering using one or the other. So first of all, OpenStreetMap is a community-driven data project. That means that behind OpenStreetMap, maybe we should look a little bit of it. All right. Oops. <laughs> Small problems. Okay, so this is OpenStreetMap. This is how it looks like. Exactly like Google Maps, it's a map of the world. You can zoom in, you can zoom out. Okay. I am moving around through the map so you can notice the level of detail that you have, that you actually have everywhere. And maybe we should open Google Maps as well. Does this look more familiar to you? In essence, they're different, but when we use it, um, when we actually go a little bit deeper understanding what, what each of these are, we can find significant differences. Now, if I could just go back to my slides. Oh. Sorry. Okay, so I said that you've seen that they both look the same. I did, I did that for people that have never seen OpenStreetMap before. So you can see that they both look the same. They're just a map online, you can search for information, you can search for a place and it'll give you an answer, it will take you there. Uh, but OpenStreetMap, as I mentioned, is a community-driven data. That means that behind OpenStreetMap, that is a community, which is voluntary. A community of people that take their GPS and they go and they map things. For example, I'm standing in front of an ATM and it's a, I don't know, Bank of Italy ATM, so I just put that information inside my GPS, right? And then I go back to my computer at home. I use a specially developed software that was built by this OpenStreetMap community and I enter the data that I have and I put it on that map that you have just seen. So imagine that everything that you've seen has been done by people with their GPS. The, co the project has grown significantly in the last five to 10 years and it has forked into different, into different projects. For example, uh, HOT, which is Humanitary Open Street Map, which is a community that works with this data in order to build maps and to use them in disaster management. So this is a, um, a community-driven project that has grown at an international scale. And in the geospatial world, there are very few, if almost none, people that have heard of it. What is important is that OpenStreetMap data is very clearly licensed. You do not have to be a legal expert to understand what you can do with it and what you cannot do with it. The data that you see is open to use, reuse, and modify. At a first glance, you would say that you can use Google Maps just as well. 
but it's not true, I'm afraid. Google Maps is offering you a service, which means that it shows you that, that map that you can use, but the data behind it you cannot take. You cannot take and you cannot reuse. For example, you are not allowed by the Google license to digitize over the Google map. If you want, for example, to extract uh, the uh, contour of a lake, you are not allowed to do that on Google Maps. Legally, you are breaking the law. Another, um, typically the, the service that you are given is restricted to private use. That means that if I am a company and I want to use Google Maps, I don't know, to, to offer a service, for example, um, I don't know how to get faster from the airport to certain hotels in Perugia, if I want to use Google Maps, then Google Maps is going to tell me, okay, you are making money of it, so a part of your profit belongs to me, which is normal because Google Maps is a proprietary company. This is what they do. Um, it is typically limited to a number of requests, exactly what I have mentioned before. I do a service, I have 100 users per day. The 102nd user will not be able to access the background data anymore because Google is restricting, it's, it's his decision to restrict the access. This is just an example. Uh, the terms of services, typically unreadable. I don't know how many of you have ever tried to read and understand the terms and conditions of the services that you used. How many of you have read the terms and conditions from Facebook? One person, <laughs> two people. Okay, how many of you are using Facebook today? Okay, <laughs> aren't you a little bit worried <laughs> what they're going to do with your pictures, if they're going to make money of... Anyway, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Another important aspect regarding uh, the Google Maps or any other proprietary uh, company uh, that offers services just as Google just as Google, is that the data behind it is not open. As I mentioned before, we're going to do a very little experiment and we're going to extract data from OpenStreetMap and we're going to see how it looks like. Okay? So any questions by now? Anyone has any kind of curiosity regarding what I've said so far? Okay, that means that I'm boring you, or is very, very clear. <laughs> okay, so now uh, going closer to the subject, maps. Well, maps have been around for ever. Every time you have imagined how to get to a place, you build a mind map. Yeah? If you are a little bit talented with drawing and you put your mind map to a draw, then you're making a map in the normal sense, so to speak. Well, they have changed a little bit over time. This is what maps used to look like. <laughs> and this is a map from 16th century. Okay, and this is what maps fairly look today. And of course, important is to say that our interaction with maps have changed a little bit over time as well. So, a little bit or a little bit more. So, uh, what is happening with that? What does, what does uh, that mean? That means that at this point, everybody, almost everybody in an urban uh, area, so to speak, has access to a map, right? He just takes his telephone out, he just goes to Google Maps, uh, iOS Maps, doesn't matter, and he has access to a map. What does it mean? It means that if you browse a little bit on the internet, I can assure you that you can find a million tools online today to build a map in two steps, in three steps, in ten minutes. It doesn't matter how hard it is. It doesn't matter what you have to put on a map. You can build it almost instantly. If you look for tutorials now online, you can find a multitude of them. So, do we have a problem or not? Well, uh, that is discussable. The first question that you should put as people that don't build maps every day, as people that are not cartographers, as people that don't work in the geo field, but 
could use a map as an instrument to transmit information, to send out a message. The first question, which in my opinion of a non-journalist person, the first question that you should ask yourself is that, is your data mappable? And the second question is if you make a map, does it really help you? Do you really transmit your message better? Do your people understand you better? So, uh, if your data has a related uh, uh, location information, then, of course, your data is mappable. Uh, what does it mean, location-related information? That means that you can have a pair of longitude and latitude. True. That means that you can have a zip code. That means that you can have a street name and address. That means that you can have any kind of reference. And due to the advancement of technology, in order to make a fast map, you do not need, for example, perfect uh, coordinates that come in numbers like the latitude and longitude. No. Today, you can geocode data that comes with uh, related location information, such as just the name street, yeah, which is not a number, which is a letter, which is formed with letters. So the technology is really advancing and things are becoming easier to build. This is why I think it's important to uh, draw your attention towards the reason why you should build or should not build a map. Uh, what is important to remember is that maps are useful only when significant information is added through special correlation and analysis. The first role of a map that we know of and the first reason why we ever build a map was to orientate ourselves. We needed to get to, from point A to point B and we needed to tell somebody else how to get from point A to point B. So we draw a map and we sent it. Nowadays, this, this primer scope is not, no longer the most important. In the geospatial world, one of the primary scope is spatial correlation and analysis. Most things in this world happen someplace, and most things in this world are correlated together. So when w this spatial information, this, this related location information helps you make a special correlation. Why do people that go to very poor schools do not know how to vote better, for example? Why do people that are not close to a hospital are, have, a li have a life expectancy which is much lower? So this is what a spatial correlation and analysis refers to. Okay, um, looking at one's data. Important to mention, data is neutral. Data is not good, data is not bad. Data is just data. The way that you interpret what you have, the information that you have, that is what makes it and gives it a sense. That is the meaning, that is knowledge. So. Steps to build the best map ever, in my opinion, is to put all the information that you have ever had related to that subject on your map and then regarding and always remembering what is the message that you want to transmit, just starting remove what you have placed on your map. What does this mean? This means that you curate the way that the information gets to your reader. What does this mean? That every map that you have ever seen has been curated in the same way. That means that one person or a group of people builds a map and they say, okay, this information is related to the subject, but I, in my opinion, as an expert, do not consider this information essential for my reader. So what does this mean? that we, even if we tend to look at maps as things of mathematical accuracy, they're not always such. They come with an interpretation. And you should always be critic with the maps that you see and try to understand a little bit even the process that led to them. 
okay? And another very important aspect is that you should very well understand what you map. A good cartographic representation is a representation that comes from a person that understands the actual field. So I have heard a lot of times the term of unicorn, which is the data scientist, and I was really curious to see how they define this. And one very important aspect is that this unicorn understands the field in, in which he's working. He's not only technical savvy. He doesn't all just write programs overnight. No, he understands what he's actually studying. So this is important even when you build a map, even when you do a graph. Okay, now going a little bit further in the program, in the problem. Building maps, when we build maps, what are the things that we choose with most easiness? Colors. Do not do it anymore. <laughs> Colors are very important when building a map. Why? Well, better this one. Color is an extremely powerful visual element. It's one of the most powerful, I must say, in my opinion at least. It leads the eye to where you want it to look over a map. Just imagine that you are looking at a map that has been gradually, uh, that has a gradual color. For example, from very light red to very dark red. That leads your eye on the actual representation. You're actually looking in the red corner much more because that is important. It actually leads the eye. It offers dominance. It tells you where to look. It induces ideas. For example, if you see a map that has red spots on it, you will automatically think that where you have red spots, it's a problem. There is something wrong. There is a disaster. There is a fire. There is a flood. There is something. Red means something in our mind. Blue means something else, right? For example, if you look at a map that is built with blue and red, you will think at some point that that is a temperature map, right? Blue goes to cold and red goes to hot. So it induces ideas. And even more, it creates structures in your map. We are humans, and one of our best ability is to find and identify and define patterns in what we look at. This is what happens when you look at a map. The first thing that you do, even if you're not <coughs> conscious that that's exactly what you do, you look for patterns. You look for the way it was built and for patterns. What is telling you? So... Um, <coughs> Uh, Edward Tuft, in 1990, in Envisioning Information, had a few ideas related to the way that we should use colors in maps. And one thing that he said, and I consider it important to write down, is that avoiding catastrophe becomes the first principle in bringing color to information. Above all, do no harm. And I have chosen just a few rules that I think that are important and somehow easy to remember in using colors in your maps. Uh, probably an important one is don't place bright colors close together because it will offend the eye of the public. It, 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 it hurts, it actually hurts. So uh, don't place light colors on a white background because your map becomes very dim. You can't see it very well. And I, even though I use and I have written these uh, advices by referring to maps, I think they refer very well to any kind of representation that you would do. And don't use only two complementary colors on your map because it will break it in two. If they're both powerful and you have only two, then it will break it because the brain cannot form a pattern. He doesn't know what's happening. You just have two, let's say, quantitative information that does not go together on the same map. Okay, we've talked about this. Now, moving forward to the composition, to exactly how we are building this map. If you have any question, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. I won't mind. <laughs> okay. 
An important thing related to color and the way that we see it on a map is the visual hierarchy. The impression of being on top is given by the visual contrast. The dominant color will be always, but always on top. So this is a clear, clear idea of what I've tried, the, what I've tried to, to say before when I talked about the dominance of a powerful color. So it is very clear that that small, uh, small square, which is very dark green, is on top. What does it mean? It's important. It has more, it's more dense. It leads the eye into the center of the map. When you build your maps, if you want to lead the eye to a certain information, you will give bright color to that certain part. What's happening with visual hierarchy beyond that? To create it, it is necessary to group objects with similar characteristics, such as shape, size, color, and even proximity. <coughs> a, way the way, a way that we create structures when we build a map. There are a few elements that we use, or you could use, when we actually make such a representation. There are six, and I think they're important. First of all, we're talking about proximity. What we, plus, what we put close together, the public will take that as a group. <coughs> Something that is close together means that they're together, so it is a group. Similarity. If it's similar, then again they're a group. This refers to the pattern idea that I've, I've mentioned before. This happens, and you use this, for example, if you want to build a map with more than just one variable. You want to build a map where you want to show the density of population and um, the density of the hospitals, for example, number of hospitals per 1,000 uh, inhabitants and, um, let's say, uh, density at 1,000. And what you do is you use symbols for these two, for this two, uh, two pieces of information, symbols that go together. For example, for one you use a circle, for one you use a square, but they, you use them for the same size. So when you look at a map, if the two shapes have the same sizes, even if the shapes are different, and one is for hospitals, one is for density, you will understand that there you have a lot of people and a lot of hospitals. Okay, so it is for building this kind of pattern in the mind of the person that's looking at your map. Delineation. I think that uh, here it is better to look at the picture in the right side, where putting a background before some ele uh, a background uh, on some elements, you can actually induce the idea that they are together. And uh, the reason why I am explaining all of these is that these is when analyzing a map, you should be considering these things because, or at least I, I think that some should consider these things because putting, for example, a background on uh, the same background on different elements that have no connection in real life or in, as a real phenomena but putting the background there, in my mind, can induce a wrong idea that those are connected when they're really not. Okay, limits. For example, the two, uh, the two shapes on the uh, left side uh, are not closed, but somehow, because of the way they are built and because of our power of continuing in our mind those elements because we are so accustomed with ellipses and with uh, those kind of unequal squares, we can consider them closed, right? And we can consider them as unified. Continuity. Curves are always perceived as continued. It doesn't matter if using another element, you know, you theoretically you break the curve, it will always, in our mind, be considered as a continuity. And of course, connectivity is obviously the reason to, it's obviously a way to, to group things together. Okay. Types of maps and types of data. There are three types of data. 
Data can be, and when I mean data, I, I'd like you to think of tabular data, for example, because it's the most at hand example. You're looking at a tabular data and you think, what kind of information is this? What, what data is it? How is it structured? Actually, this is the good question. How is it structured? So data can be structured as a sequence, right? Going from right to left, it's one, two, three, four, five, and going up or going down. Data can be diverging, right? It can go from a negative going through a middle, a middle value and going there in the, uh, in the opposite side, so diverging. And you're thinking about diverging things like temperature. Temperature is always going to be a data set that is diverging. Why? Because you have the zero value, which is in the middle. And everything that grows to the right or to the left is a maximum, right? But it's a negative maximum and a positive maximum. This means diverging. And qualitative data. Qualitative data, the best example is white, blue, red, Milena, Zara, Adrian. This is qualitative data. It's not good, it's not bad. It's okay. Why do I consider this important? Because when considering, after asking yourself if the data you have can be put on a map, after asking yourself if building a map, investing the time in building a map is the best use of your time, and after saying yes to both of these questions, you look at your data set. And what do you do the first thing? You try to identify the structure. You have read the data, you know very well the field, you know the message because you have st stood there and read and read and analyzed and you know the message that you want to transmit. You're not going to put a data in your, in a, a table in your article, right? Nobody's going to read three pages of tabular data. So you're thinking that you need a graphic or a diagram, or better yet, a map. Why? Because what you have there applies to a place on Earth. So you have decided you want to build a map. These are the first questions and the first steps you make. The second thing, you look at the way that your data is actually structured. You know if it's good, it's bad. But you need, the, the idea of structure goes beyond of the message that you're sending. If, if you like, it's the technical part of the data set you're looking at. Is it sequential? Do you have, for example, uh, crime information in a town? That is never going to be diverging because you do not have minus three crimes. No, you'll always have from zero to two, hopefully. Anyway, you'll always have from zero to a maximum positive. So you know that that is a diverging map. So if you want to represent that map, you will never use two colors that are powerful. I'm not going to use for zero, red, and for a maximum plus, blue. The message that you send is not necessarily wrong, but is very difficult to be interpreted by other people. Because just as you, everybody is looking at a map at least once a day. And even if you do not learn cartography every day and you do not learn that a river is blue, when you look on a map, you almost unconsciously know that the river is blue and when you have green is nature, right? Everybody considers the same. So if you put, sorry, so if you put red for zero, it doesn't work. It's not, I would not say correct, but let's just say it's not suitable. And your map would be difficult to understand. You put red on the positive side. Why? Because having a crime in a city is bad. Red is a color of disaster. If you put red over there, people will know, oh, I have a lot of crimes here. If you want, if you have only this qu uh, mm, quantitative information, and you want to emphasize on the areas that you have crimes and you do not want to emphasize on the areas that you do not have nothing. Don't use two colors. It, it's, it's too much. You're complicating your life. Use one color and a hue of it. So you use very light red, 
very almost not noticeable for the areas where you do not have crime and you intensely raise the intensity of the color, the hue of the color. Does that make sense? Does that apply to the maps that you usually see? More or less. Okay. Um, an idea regarding quant uh, qualitative information. Usually, cartographers say never use more than seven colors on a map. Why? Because it becomes difficult for the human brain to interpret it. This is not a wimp of cartographers, uh, but it is a scientific proven, scientifically proven fact. Uh, using more than seven colors will become difficult for your reader to actually follow what patterns. It's going to be difficult for him to assimilate what, what, what the message is and to understand it. Uh, a thing regarding diverging, usually in data sets that diverge from a common, from a medium value, from the average value, usually that average value has the uh, lightest hue, right? If you use blue or green, the value in the middle will be a combination of the two, but very light. Why? If you want to show intensities in two points in a map or in an image, you will need to grow your intensity. You will need to show gradients, right? If you do not use a very light color at the medium, in the medium on the average, then you will lose the power of attracting the eye of your audience to the two maximum that you're having running around on your map or your, your diagram. Right? Okay, any questions so far? How many of you have ever built a map before? Okay, that's good. Was it? <laughs> Does it seem important? You can say no, we'll never see each other again. <laughs> The idea is that we all have the intuition of how to build a map. The thing is, and why I think it is significant to analyze a little bit behind, is that I could actually build a map and to induce the audience into having another idea. I can have the data, I can have the correct data, I can use cartographic rules and present the most inaccurate map ever. And um, that's a mistake. But sometimes that is a willingful mistake, meaning that I want to do that. I want to induce another message. And the idea is, not, is to build a correct map, to know what you're doing when you're doing it, but also to open your eyes and your mind every time you will see another map in a newspaper, every time you will see another map on the television or on your computer. There are some questions that I hope from now on will pop into your mind. Okay, so um, one more question. What was the reason why you draw that map? You wanted to orientate, you wanted to show what? What things? I'm sorry? But what, why a map and not a chart? Because it was on Earth somewhere? Was it important to where it was? Yeah? data re related to countries, so building a, a chart wouldn't make any sense to, for people to think where it is, and just looking at the map gives a picture. Exactly. That is a spatial correlation. For example, if I know that two countries are close together, 
and they have completely divergent opinions regarding a certain situation, a certain political situation, then that map is going to raise question in my mind and I'm going to wonder why do they consider that because that issue could affect them both equally. Why? Because they're close. I can read that information from a map in a matter of seconds just looking at it and looking at the geography of it, right? We have an actual science for that, it's geopolitics. <gasps> Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, apparently I have only 10 minutes, 10 more minutes. So, hmm? and then questions. Okay, I will go really fast. So there are four types of maps, you know them all. Uh, important to mention, not really, I'm just going through. So this is a chlor on the left side is a chloroplast map, which means that you have colors representing um, um, areas, right? You use this map to represent ratio. You will always see maps like this when you want to represent density of something density of population, you will use this one. Why? Because density is a ratio. Number of people per 1,000 squares, right? You never use this kind of map to represent raw data. Something that, it, for example, number of cows you have per country. Why? Because Vatican is very small, Liechtenstein is very small, and it, when you represent it close to Italy, for example, the difference is not, going to, is not going to reflect the reality of the phenomena of which you're representing. If you make a ratio to the surface, to the area of the country, it makes more sense, right? Italy is going to have more cows because it's bigger. Uh, the one on the left is isopleth. That means that you have lines of equal values that divide areas. Okay, this is a proportional symbols math, uh, map. Sorry, um, I was going to present a small f food for thought here because I found this map on the internet and in my opinion, maybe it's not the best map that they could have. They represent the European forestry production by country and you can see the forestry production is in million cubic meters, it is not ratio, this is raw data. Uh, for example, could, um, I don't know, Sweden have a bigger circle than Monaco? Why? Sweden, even if it has less uh, forestry, to say per <coughs> 1,000 kilometers, it will always have more forest than Monaco. Why? Because of size. Therefore, this map can induce a wrong idea, right? And this is a dot density map. I'm not sure it's very clear. Uh, dot density means that each dot represent an individual. For example, you can represent uh, the population of the United States like that, right? A hundred, a hundred uh, citizens represents a dot. Here it is a difference in the way that we represent the same data set. The number of classes in which we have divided and the division method are the same because we can divide numbers differently. We can divide them, for example, regarding the number of elements in a class that is an equal interval, right? It doesn't matter how, if I have very big variations within the interval, if I have in each class only five elements, that's what it's going to represent, right? So the difference here is given by the projection and the actual form of the map, what kind of map it is. And you can see here, for example, the difference in the first on the left, the difference between Canada and Europe. When you first look at the map, you don't really say that they're in the same category, right? No, you don't, because the the area that these two um, that these two surfaces represent on the actual image is not as big. Therefore, your eye, when looking for patterns, will not identify Europe as being as important. It will make it m smaller because the representation, because the polygon is smaller for it. The color of the polygon is smaller for it. 
otherwise, looking at the map on the right with the dots, you can see the, the uh, resembling of the fact that your eye is attracted to Europe as well. And now it's important, right? You see a lot of color there. That means that they must have, have they must be in the same category taken as a whole. Okay, going further. Map check. Um, you have built a map. You have decided that your data is mappable. You can put it on Earth. You have decided that if you make a map, you can transmit your message better. Good. Then you actually build your map. You have decided what colors to use. You have decided what type of representation to use. And now your map is done. Before sending it out, please check these things. Geographical elements such as name places. Important to be correct. Important not to cover important message that comes from the data. You do not want the name of the country to cover a significant element that you have placed on your map. Correct position of what you manually placed on your map or geocoded. Right? You have placed a point that should represent a hospital. Check twice if it's there. Right? Topology. Topology is a mathematical um, uh, um, science, <laughs> if I can say so. And this explains how elements share their spaces. For example, um, boundaries of countries in a topological way will never have um, overlaps, right? In reality, countries should not have overlaps. When you have geometries in your software, you should not have overlaps. It is a reality that comes from the world outside, transmitted into what we use in our maps. Good. Have you removed unnecessary information? A, a crowded map is not a beautiful map. A crowded map is not a good map. No, make it as simple as possible. You want to transmit your message as fast as possible. But be aware and not remove more information than you should. Just be clear in your mind that you have erased all the unnecessary information. Do you need, for example, to put the name of the river twice? No, you do not need. Cartography uh, cartographic elements like projection, like color, like legend. You build a perfect map. You forgot to put the legend. No one will understand the message. So put the legend on. Is it for orientation? Is it to show differences in sizes, in real sizes? Then put a scale on it. I want to know what five centimeters on your map mean. Good. And data attribution. Essential. Is the data that you put on something that you build? It's your attribution. Is it something that you took from somebody else? Then attribute the work. It's important. It's important because uh, it's ethical, ethical and because sometimes when you use, for example, official data, your work gets an added value, right? Good, oh, okay. Mapping tools, free and open source tools. Remember this name, Ausgeo Live. There is a community just like yours, very big, very beautiful, all over the world that, <laughs> that handles free and open source software for <coughs> geospatial. You have a question, just find a mailing list, and I can assure you that one of the thousand people that are, are there, are out there, or me, <laughs> will answer for you. Open source means that you can take use without buying for it, right? Um, open source means that you have a lot of documentation for it. It means people actually write how to build something, how to curate data, how to manage your attribute table, and so on. And this Osgeo Live, actually, it is a CD that it's bootable. That means that you take it, you put it in your computer, and you boot from it. That means that you can start an operating system like Windows, like Ubuntu, like any other system. A system that already has installed all the software that you could ever need to handle geographical information, to handle, to visualize, to make web mapping, to make databases, geodatabases, and whatever. 
And this is a slide with resources. I think you will be, I think that the presentation will be available for you, so there's no need to, I don't know, copy anything. Oh, okay. Okay, done. And, oh, oh, so I can go back there. Uh, this was the moment when I was supposed to show you something else, but I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not allowed to do it anymore. I, I'm receiving signs of no, no, stop. If you have any questions, any kind of question, yes, please. Um, this is a very newbie question. So if I used um, Google Fusion with Google Maps, can I use it with OpenStreetMap? Why would you use that? Why would you do that? <laughs> no, uh, no. The, the question, the question is, and um, I'm trying to understand why you, why wouldn't you use OpenStreetMap from the beginning? And then I'm thinking that you would like to use Google Fusion Tables because you have your information in a spreadsheet, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is that um, I do not know a technical way in which you could insert the spreadsheets into OpenStreetMap. That's not possible. Uh, I don't know if you can, but um, no, I don't. I don't think that's possible, actually. The idea of Google, uh, behind everything that Google does, is that it offers you everything, but it's linked only within, within self. So it's not, I could show you how to take data from OpenStreetMap if you're interested and how to, to put it in a software and to use it. Very simple. I'd like to mention that I'm going to be around until Sunday, so if you ever have a question regarding maps, you can just stop me on the way, and I'll try to be as forthcoming as possible. You could export the data point as KML, and then somehow get it back to OpenStreetMap. It really depends what you want to do. It really depends on that. Because you can take data from OpenStreetMap, for example, actual data, not only the map. And as, as he said, you can export your data as something that can be placed on a map. But together, Google with OpenStreetMap don't really go together. I hope I answered the question at least a little bit. Any questions? Other? Yes? Uh, thank you for uh, the You're presentation. Very much uh, my question regards um, kind of geopolitical problem that sometimes can come out with the different data set with the country names uh, and or stuff like that. I mean, s sometimes um, country names are different, uh, or uh, in some part of the world, uh, boundaries uh, are contended. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering if there is a convention uh, to address these kind of issues. I mean yes, there is, cartographically speaking, there is a convention when you have boundaries issues because the world from the very beginning always had a boundary problem somewhere around. So ever since maps, map, maps were made, they do have this way of signaling, of showing where you have that problem, and that is with a dotted line. That means that you have a problem there. And the way that you choose to show the line, you could, for example, choose to cross boundaries to show the both boundaries that have not been accepted and there are, uh, are in some kind of a battle, legal or anything. But cartographically speaking, you show that with the dotted line because you know boundaries of a country are a full line. Yeah, but uh, there, are, th there is a way to uh, take this automatically and put it into a map, for example, with some software as a Tableau Public, or uh, is the, the tool that I use, but uh, if there is a way of um, signaling a, a, contended, a boundary that has some problem uh, without drawing a map, I mean, with some automatic tool, Maps are an image of the world. If something changes in the world, it will not automatically be tran translated, for example, in a software or in a data set. Usually when you have these kind of issues, 
that raise problems. For example, if you build an official map and you go to, I don't know what conference at the UN or I don't know, you can actually have real problems. So when you deal with this kind of situation, usually you do not have a data set out there somehow that could represent the, the issue, the actual issue. And maybe you are not um, okay, maybe you do not agree with the information that you found online. So the power of these softwares, of these programs, is that you can take that information, you can add it, and you can change it, you can add value to it. For example, you can draw that line, and it's not difficult to do it. But the basic idea is that the changes that happen in the world don't always and very fast um, get translated into the big data sets around the world, like OpenStreetMap or in OpenStreetMap you do, but in, I don't know, in Google Maps, for example, or it really depends on the matter because of its sensitivity and on the way you want to interpret it. For example, would you interpret Crimea as being part of Ukraine or so you, okay, other questions? Thank okay. you, yeah. Hi, thanks, uh, thanks again for a great presentation. Oh, I just welcome. wanted to go back to something you spoke about earlier regarding data licensing. Okay, sure. Um, and the fact that different countries have different licensing arrangements and there can be legal issues that come up with that. Any sort of specific challenges or problems that you've come up against in that regard? Um, I have a very good example, actually, on that matter. And it's an example uh, that happened with OpenStreetMap uh, I think about a few years ago. So what happens is that OpenStreetMap has a license for its data. And that means that every single bit of information that they have in OpenStreetMap is licensed under that data. What happened is that over the years, th this project grow, grew, right? And uh, you had, for example, um, I don't know, city halls that had plans for their town, and they said, okay, I have a small community here of OpenStreetMap, and they're coming to the city hall, and they're asking for the plans to put it on their OpenStreetMap, and I am an open mayor, and I say, okay, take it. The people from OpenStreetMap take the information, and they put it in their bulk data, for example, they put it on their map. That means that those plans are shared under the same license. Now what happened was that when this um, um, building of different licenses, open licenses, started, they realized, legal advisors realized that their open license was not compatible with the open street map license. So the people from OpenStreetMap just removed the data because they could not share it like that anymore. These, this is a clear example of, of a problem of legal interoperability. Okay. Th thanks a lot. So Creative Commons would kind of do away with, with some of that issue. And, uh, I'm and sorry? I, Say again? I, I just, Creative Commons would provide sort of an international standard that would adhere everyone to the same rules. Yes. Okay. Uh, and here, the matter is a little bit more, uh, more profound, if I can say, because OpenStreetMap has a license that applies to databases. For example, from le a legally uh, point of view, for, I take data sets from everyone in this room, I build a database, and then I can use a license for my database. And if you want a data set, you can go to the partner and take it. But if you want my database, you will have to, uh, to listen to the license that I put. So there, there are different levels of licensing. This, these are legal matters that are pretty delicate now with the, all the open government licensing and the licensing that comes from OpenStreetMap. That is in the geospatial field. I don't know much more from other, other places. Thanks a lot. from open data, so they, there can be a lack yeah. in mapping. So why should they use that uh, or, and uh, I don't know, not using Google Maps? 
because Google Maps doesn't give you data. It just gives you a service. It just shows you the data. It shows you the map and says, you can use this one. I can understand it. But I can't, you said that I can, I cannot use a spreadsheet on open uh, street map. No, you cannot. I cannot. So, um, if I have, like, um, um, uh, I tell you, uh, I built a map. Uh, there was like, um, uh, there was a day off, and I was mapping all the all the shops that were open. Hmm? So uh, all the shops write a form. It, this form went in a, in a spreadsheet, and this fed, fed uh, uh, a map. Mm -hmm. So I needed uh, a Google map. No? You needed a background map, yeah. yeah. So I cannot use OpenStreetMap for, for that. Yes, you could. You would take oh. the points that you made, and you can take the data from OpenStreetMap, yeah? And you can just uh, overlap it. I could actually show you something really, really fast. I cannot show this really, really fast. Just super, super, super fast if I can find my mouse. Privately, <laughs> oh. maybe. <laughs> okay. Okay. What, what you can do is you can, what you, what, what you could do, what you could do is use a super, uh, super easy instrument tool, for example, like QGIS. It's not that difficult if you're not interested in, I don't know what kind of special correlation. You can bring the map from OpenStreetMap, right? and you can insert your spreadsheet there, and you can overlap it. Okay. Cool. Okay. All can right. Um, great. Well, thank you so much, Katrina. It's wonderful. Thank you <laughs> for listening to me. Um, so tomorrow we'll have, if we've got two more workshops for you and a panel. In the morning, there's a panel on pan-European approaches to data journalism. Gregor will be talking about ways to break design principles, um, and we'll, Rita, another School of Data Fellow, will be talking about how to use data from the Twitter API. Um, and we also have stickers for you. So yeah, have a great evening. See you tomorrow. So this is bringing open, sorry, 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 I'm so sorry. <laughs> this is bringing OpenStreetMap into a desktop program. This is something that is installed, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Great.